Hello, my name is Daniel Margolis, and it's my pleasure to present to you my recommendations for how to read prostate MRI. A brief disclosure, I'm a consultant for Blue Earth Diagnostics. The presentation will go over the resources, specifically the PIRATS website, the interpretation of prostate MRI, and reporting. Prostate Imaging Reporting and Data Systems, version 2 has become the standard for prostate MRI with over 20 publications. It's freely available on the ACR website and covers many different components of prostate MRI. I would bring your attention to the fact that it does describe recommendations for technique. On the website uh, at uh, acr.org, I'd like to bring your attention to two components of the website. First is a link to the full text document. And second is a link to the text or PDF file for the report template. Here's an example of the report template. Note that it does include recommendations for the technique, uh, stating that it's PIRADS compliant, uh, including the field strength, coils, uh, IV contrast, and pulse sequence parameters. Uh, and that it's important to include the prostate volume this can either be computed by length times width times height times 0.524 or from volumetric segmentation. Uh, and it is important to describe the quality, uh, especially any components that may detract from diagnostic confidence, such as hemorrhage or geometric distortion, and a general description of the peripheral and transition zones. It's also important to describe the structures surrounding the prostate, including the uh, uh, periprostatic fascia, the neurovascular bundles, seminal vesicles, and also lymph nodes and uh, other pelvic organs, including bones. And you want to give the overall PIRADS category, which is the highest category of any of the lesions identified. This brings us to interpretation. PIRADS is designed for assessing primary significant prostate cancer. It's multiparametric, including T2-weighted imaging, dynamic contrast enhanced imaging, and diffusion-weighted imaging. Spectroscopic imaging is considered optional. T2-weighted images are crucial for evaluating transition zone lesions and for staging. Diffusion-weighted imaging is the most specific component and includes a high B-value DWI and ADC map. Dynamic contrast-enhanced imaging now primarily reflects the early enhancement component, and perfusion maps and enhancement curves are optional. The high B-value DWI is crucial for assessment. You can see here that there is low signal in the anterior left portion of the prostate on the ADC map and that this area looks iso-intense on the intermediate B800 DWI image. But the natively acquired B1400 and a calculated B1400 image, which is generated from lower B values, shows that there is focal hyperintensity. Similarly, dynamic contrast timing is crucial. Here is a pre-contrast image of the prostate where you can see that it's uniformly T1 hypointense. At the early enhancement time point, you can see that there is focal early enhancement, but eight seconds later, this is nearly entirely obscured, even on a subtraction map. Of note, the K-trans map, the pharmacokinetic map of Washin, also identifies this area as early enhancement, and I'll show you in a moment why this can be so useful. The location is based on a diagram. So the apex is the bottom of the prostate uh, and the base is the top. And the zones include the peripheral zone, which is majority of the apex and surrounds the posterior and lateral aspects of the prostate. The central zone, which is found only at the base and uh, invests the ejaculatory ducts. The transition zone, which is generally heterogeneous and enlarged with prostatic hyperplasia. The anterior fibromuscular stroma, which is devoid of glandular elements and found anteriorly. And the urethra, which is found centrally. 
And a diagram in the Pirates document provides the description for how the components of these zones are reported. The assessment of diffusion-weighted imaging is crucial for the peripheral zone and is qualitative. So you can see that very low suspicion are areas where the ADC is high and DWI is low. Where there's non-mass-like ADC hypointensity or where it's within a BPH nodule in the transition zone, this is considered low suspicion. Focal mildly hypointense ADC and mildly hypointense DWI is considered intermediate suspicion. And where it's moderate to a markedly hypointense on the ADC and markedly hypointense on the DWI, um, but less than 1.5 centimeters is high suspicion. With very high suspicion, uh, those lesions which would be category four but are either invasive or greater than 1.5 centimeters. And here you can see examples where uh, if it is diffuse, it is generally considered category two. If it's uh, not the brightest thing on the high B value DWI, uh, it would be category three. And the brightest thing on the high B value DWI and darkest thing on the ADC map is category four. Uh, and when it's very large or invasive, that would be category five. One addition to Pyrides version 2.1 that will be released in the uh, coming weeks to months is that a linear structure in the peripheral zone is also category two. Evaluation of the shape and margins is important for defining transition zone suspicion. The only shape which really confers any degree of suspicion is the lenticular shape uh, and obviously uh, invasiveness. The margins are also very important where uh, lesions that are encapsulated are considered low suspicion. Uh, and those with speculated or irregular or blurred margins are considered high suspicion. One distinction that's important to keep in mind is between obscured and indistinct. Uh, blurred or irregular margins are those where you feel certain that you know that it is not a sharp margin, that there's a broad zone of transition. Obscured is when you can't be certain whether or not the margins are sharp. And this can occur from anything from uh, artifact from obscured is when the margins are not obscured is where you're not certain that the margins are sharp. And this can occur because of artifact from motion or geometric distortion or from hemorrhage or adjacent inflammatory change or BPH or even hemorrhage. Here are some examples. You can see that in this oval lesion which abuts the surgical capsule, which is defined as the border between the transition and peripheral zone, um, and uh, at the uh, medial aspect, it borders BPH. And so it's hard to know exactly what the borders of this lesion would actually look like. Uh, as opposed to these where you can see where the uh, edge should be uh, and that it is indistinct or blurred. Uh, and then here's an example of a capsule, a sharp black line uh, that demarcates uh, this BPH nodule. And then obviously uh, invasive or speculated margins are suspicious and uh, invasiveness can be either obvious or suggested by capsular irregularity. Assessment of T2-weighted imaging in the transition zone is also fairly straightforward. Uh, when the transition zone is homogeneously intermediate signal intensity, uh, this cons is considered category one. A circumscribed uh, or encapsulated nodule is category two. Uh, and again, a lesion with obscured margin uh, or those that do not qualify for other categories is considered category three. So lenticular lesions and those which are non-circumscribed, meaning irregular or blurred margins, uh, and are homogeneously moderately hypointense or category four, and any category four lesion which is invasive or greater than 1.5 centimeters uh, would be considered category five. 
An important thing about the categorization of T2 weighted imaging in the peripheral zone. So linear wedge-shaped lesions are also category two. However, a circumscribed lesion in the peripheral zone is category four. And in a moment, you'll see that the T2 categorization in the peripheral zone is not particularly important. Now, in uh, Pyrod's version 2.1, you'll notice that uh, completely encapsulated lesions will be uh, uh, deprecated to category one, whereas uh, circumscribed or partially encapsulated lesions will remain category two. And this brings us to reporting. So the assessment is based on a flow chart. You consider first whether it's peripheral or transition zone, and then look at the uh, dominant pulse sequence. So in the transition zone is T2, in the peripheral zone is DWI. And uh, for categories 1, 2, 4, and 5, uh, basically the overall category is the same as the pulse sequence category. For category 3, you need to look at one other pulse sequence, dynamic contrast in the peripheral zone and diffusion weighted imaging in the transition zone. Uh, in Pyrad's version 2.1, uh, there will also be the ability to upgrade a T2 category 2 lesion to overall category 3, depending on diffusion weighted imaging. And another way to think about it is this flow chart. So in this flow chart, when a box is true, you branch right, and when it's false, you uh, branch left. And I'll show you how to use this to think about lesion categorization as we go through the MRI. Um, and this brings us to the report text. I'm going to draw your attention to uh, how we describe lesions in the prostate. Um, and so this brings us to uh, the prostate MRI. Um, and the first thing I'd like to do is to show you why you might want to use uh, a, um, a perfusion map as opposed to a... Uh, raw enhancement curve. Um, so um, as you see here, as we go through the prostate, uh, there is an area of hemorrhage, and that's only really conspicuous on the pre-contrast T1-weighted Im uh, images. In fact, this is more likely uh, not hemorrhage, but calcium based on the T2-weighted images. So you can see that there's complete absence of signal on T2-weighted imaging uh, and on uh, the ADC map but also, if you co-localize it uh, using the sagittal images, uh, you'll notice that there's absent signal on uh, the perfusion map and on the high B-value DWI. So this is probably calcification. Um, now, as we scroll through the uh, dynamic contrast-enhanced imaging, eventually we get to the early enhancement map, but it does involve going through a number of series um, and that the enhancement uh, basically looks the same as what we see on uh, the uh, K-trans map. And so it's uh, not necessary, but uh, very convenient uh, if you have uh, the ability to use that. So as we go through the prostate, um, here is a lesion at the base that I've already measured uh, and so that's uh, almost certainly the most suspicious lesion. So we'll start with this one. You can see that um, it's at the uh, posterior lateral right base. Um, so if we look at the level of the prostate, we can see that it's at the base and uh, it measures 1.6 centimeters. Uh, it's invasive. It's extending outside of the prostate. And in fact, it's extending into the seminal vesicles. Um, it has markedly hypointense ADC, markedly hyperintense DWI, uh, and focal early enhancement. And so let's think about how we would describe this on the uh, lesion description. So the location, base, right, peripheral, posterior, lateral, um, and the order of the level, the side, and then the uh, uh, location within the zone uh, is arbitrary, um, but you do want to use the standard descriptor. Uh, the size is 1.6 centimeters. Uh, it's invasive, greater than 1.5 centimeters, 
so that's T2 category 5 out of 5. And I like to give the uh, number out of 5, uh, f especially for those refers that may be unfamiliar with the category system. The diffusion weighted imaging, it's again markedly uh, hypointense on ADC, markedly hyperintense on DWI greater than 1.5 centimeters, and it's invasive, so DWI category 5 out of 5. There's focal early enhancement, so that's positive. It's invasive. There's extra prostatic extension into the seminal vesicles. And so uh, let's go to our flow chart. So it's in the peripheral gland. It's not linear or wedge-shaped. It is the brightest thing on the DWI and the darkest thing on the ADC, and it's invasive, so it's overall category 5. Um, so let's take a look at the second lesion. Uh, and as we scroll through the prostate, you can see that there is a lesion here, but it's not the second most suspicious lesion. Uh, this is. So here at the right apex, you can see that there's this circumscribed lesion, um, and it's about one centimeter. Um, and um, it's dark on the ADC, but there are other things that are just as dark, and it's bright on the DWI. There are other things that are just as bright, but it does have focal early enhancement um, here. Um, and you could see here on the coronal and on the sagittal that it's in the apex, um, and that it probably abuts the edge of the prostate, but it's not invasive. So let's think about how we would categorize that. So the location, apex, right, peripheral, postromedial. Um, the apex is sometimes abbreviated with an X rather than an A. Um, the size, 1.0 centimeters. Uh, T2-weighted imaging, it's circumscribed, uh, but less than 1.5 centimeters, so it's category 4 out of 5. Remember, circumscribed in the peripheral zone is considered category 4. For DWI, it's moderately hypointense, moderately hyperintense. Uh, and it's less than uh, 1.5 centimeters. So it's not the marked hyperintensity on the DWI, therefore category 3 out of 5. Uh, for DCE, there's focal early enhancement, um, and it abuts the prostate margin, but the prostate margin appears intact. So uh, T2, 4 out of 5, DWI, 3 out of 5, a focal early enhancement. Let's go back to our flow chart. So again, it's peripheral, it's not radial or uh, wedge-shaped. It's not the brightest thing on the DWI or the darkest thing on the ADC, um, but there is focal early enhancement. So we branch right and we wind up with category four out of five overall. Um, okay, and let's go back to that last lesion. So as we scroll up here, um, you can see that the peripheral gland is a little patchy. And I'm not sure exactly where the margins are, but I don't think that it's necessarily blurred. And this is uh, a bit subjective, but just for the sake of argument, let's call the margins of this lesion obscured, that I'm not certain whether or not they're truly uh, blurred. Um, and then when we look on the ADC, it's very mildly hypointense, and the high B value DWA, mildly hyperintense, uh, and there's no early enhancement. And you can see here that we're at the level of the uh, mid gland in the prostate. So uh, let's go to our reporting scheme. Um, one last thing to keep in mind is that although it is kind of indistinct, it probably does abut the uh, edge of the prostate by at least a centimeter. So. If we measure the total length and use a little bit of exaggeration, um, it's about one centimeter. And when we look at the lesion description, it's at the uh, left mid gland, peripheral zone, posterior lateral. It's about 1.0 centimeters. It's got obscured margin, so we'll call it category three. It's mildly hypointense on the ADC, mildly hyperintense on the DWI, less than 1.5 centimeters, uh, but the same category as the last one, three out of five. Um, but there is no focal early enhancement. And there is a broad base of contact with the prostate. This isn't important for categorization, but if this patient does go to surgery, and that does turn out to be significant cancer, the surgeon may give a slightly wider berth on 
that side because of the risk of capsular involvement. Okay, so let's go back to the flow chart. It's peripheral gland, not radial wind shaped. It's not the brightest or darkest thing, and there's no focal early enhancement. So this is overall category three. Um, now, one last thing to uh, observe is that uh, here's a lesion which is encapsulated here uh, at the base. So this is T2 category two. Um, it's maybe another encapsulated lesion here. So this is important that if you see something which is encapsulated and um, which has a markedly uh, hyperintense signal on the DWI and hypointense signal on the ADC, again, if it's encapsulated, it's still a category one. Now, if it's just circumscribed and it's markedly hyperintense on the DWI, markedly hypointense on the ADC, with uh, Pirates 2.1, that will be upgraded to overall category three. So this brings us to the take home points. Pirates version two describes the performance assessment and reporting for prostate MRI, which is multiparametric, qualitative, and zone specific in terms of interpretation. And it's designed for detecting primary significant cancer and for staging. Thank you very much for your attention.